Hello, it is my pleasure to have with me today Professor Lucian Turcescu, Graduate Program Director in the Department of Theological Studies at Concordia University here in Montreal. Thank you very much Professor Turcescu for accepting my invitation for an interview on ecumenism. Professor Turcescu, can you please explain us what is ecumenism? Ecumenism is uh, the quest of a number of Christian churches, uh, Roman Catholic, Orthodox, Anglican, uh, all the um, Catholic and uh, most Protestant churches, to retrieve uh, the unity of the first millennium, to um, heal the wounds among them, and to restore some sort of sacramental unity and, and visible unity that will help with the witness of Christianity in today's world. What caused the division in Christianity? <clears throat> there are um, a number of divisions and um, they go back uh, a long time ago. There were divisions that were caused by uh, uh, various councils, such as the uh, uh, Council of uh, 431 of Ephesus that led to um, the division of Christians between uh, those who followed the doctrine of Cyril and those who followed the doctrine of Nestorius. There was the Chalcedon that caused another division and we're talking today about uh, Chalcedonian and non-Chalcedonian churches. There were um, uh, issues over uh, monothelitism, the, the doctrine about the one will in Christ. And um, later, um, one of the major divisions between East and West is 1054, uh, the uh, so-called Great Schism between the Orthodox and the Catholics. Uh, this was followed in the Western uh, Catholic Church by further divisions caused in the 16th century um, between uh, reformers and, and the Catholic Church. So all of these uh, are to be addressed and um, various groups uh, working together, um, trying to understand better what happened, uh, bringing together members of these various churches, are trying to address uh, the issues that were caused by these divisions and these are all to be overcome in one way or another. Mm -hmm. What would you say are the most important ecumenical <clears throat> achievements of the past 50 years? I would say um, that probably one of the most important ones is uh, the 1982 uh, document known as Baptism, Eucharist and Ministry that was produced uh, under the Commission of Faith and Order of the World Council of Churches. And uh, this document brought together many churches and its formulation tries to address the concerns of, of all of them. Um, there is a process of reception, like in the case of any uh, document, and uh, the various churches that participated in the formulation are now expressing um, their uh, objections, their satisfaction sometimes. Um, another one is uh, one in, in which my own uh, tradition, uh, the Orthodox uh, tradition, the Orthodox Church, uh, was involved with the Roman Catholic Church. The uh, 1993 Palamand uh, statement um, between Roman Catholics and Orthodox on um, the document that said that uh, uniatism as a method of bringing churches together is an unacceptable method. This was uh, a very important document. Uh, it was received as such by the Orthodox Churches of Eastern Europe following the collapse of communism. Uh, I would also mention a third one, uh, this time between uh, the Lutheran uh, World uh, uh, Federation and the Roman Catholic Church, signed at the highest levels in 1999, um, the document on uh, the doctrine of justification that has brought um, some healing of wounds uh, over 450 years uh, after the first uh, divisions that were caused uh, between Lutherans and Roman Catholics in the, in the uh, 16th century. 
and uh, this document again like uh, the other documents I mentioned have uh, gone through a process of reception and there have been positive and negative reactions to it. Um, I think uh, that the work of many groups is important to be mentioned. There are many bilaterals and, and multilateral dialogues, national and international dialogues, and uh, they have to be uh, given credit in all this ecumenical context as contributing to uh, to the healing of the wounds. I think grassroots groups have to be given credit. I've seen uh, work done at the parish level uh, with uh, various uh, churches uh, whose uh, leadership uh, signed uh, some of these agreements doing grassroots work, doing prayer together, doing uh, uh, work, conducting work of getting to know each other better and understanding each other better in order to uh, contribute to the healing of, of these wounds. Mm -hmm. um, uh, you spoke about what happened today, but is ecumenism biblical? Uh, and my second question would be, should a Christian be involved in the ecumenical movement? I definitely believe that Christians should be involved in the ecumenical movement. There is uh, the verse in uh, the Gospel of John, uh, chapter 17, 11, that says, uh, Jesus says uh, uh, to the Father, uh, bless them so that they may be one as we are one. And this particular verse has served as a, a major uh, justification for the unity of uh, Christian churches. And uh, this is being invoked time and again by, uh, by various people involved in the ecumenical movement as the motivator. So they see uh, a, a biblical basis uh, in, in their activities uh, about, uh, about ecumenism. I would like to go a little further um, and um, speak about ecumenical activities, if you want to, to call them that, although they were not necessarily called them ecumenical at the time. Uh, since ecumenism is, is a movement that appears in the 19th and 20th century. But we see, for example, in the case of the 4th century, uh, with the Aryan crisis and with, um, with attempts at understanding the divinity of Jesus, um, we see attempts by uh, Christian theologians such as Basil of Caesarea, uh, Gregory of Nyssa, Gregory of Nazians, as not to mention the earlier uh, players like Athanasius and others, um, we see attempts at uh, bridging the, the divisions between Christianity. And um, for example, in the case of the 4th century, <clears throat> a major um, point of division was the, the choice of the word consubstantial. For, uh, to express the fact that Jesus was of the same nature with the Father, uh, with God the Father. And that's a non-biblical word. Well, Basil, for example, is really taking his ecumenical efforts very seriously, trying to reach out to groups who would not accept the homoousios, the Greek uh, term for consubstantial, and uh, he's trying to bring them together for the sake of peace in the Church. Do we see a result of this? For sure. In 381, the new creed that is issued um, is talking about the Holy Spirit as um, being uh, together worshipped and glorified with the Father and the Son. What does that mean? It means the same as the consubstantial, but the word is no longer used because it was not biblical. So you see how uh, one uh, person and and his supporters efforts to bring together peace in the church is willing to sacrifice uh, a term that was very precise homoousios was a very precise term there was just a little problem with it it was not biblical and for many people it was unacceptable so they are willing to sacrifice that term but convey the same ideas for the sake of unity in uh, in Christianity so um, we see efforts being made in the early church. Uh, there were divisions in the early church. Um, but probably um, at times there wasn't this spirit of dialogue as we have it today and, and openness as we have it today 
to be willing to hear each other uh, and to to understand each other as as the respective persons or or dialogue partners understand each other instead of saying I know better what you believe. So I think the 19th and 20th century from this point of view um, are, are a time and in, into our 21st century are a time when people are more um, more open to to hearing each other. Professor Turcescu, as an Orthodox Christian, what do you think of the involvement of the Orthodox churches in ecumenism? I think that um, the Orthodox um, were genuinely concerned for many decades about uh, ecumenism and uh, some of the early examples could be found in uh, the interwar period in the 20th century when uh, efforts were conducted between uh, the Orthodox and Anglicans uh, to uh, recognize each other's um, ministries and um, the break, the outbreak of World War II brought those efforts to an end and uh, there was no recognition of each other's ministries in the meanwhile. Um, the ordination of women by the Anglicans has complicated uh, the dialogue on this issue. And then uh, there was um, communism that came in uh, most of the Orthodox countries of Eastern Europe. Uh, beginning with Russia, um, but then you have Ukraine, you have Romania, you have Bulgaria. And communism was not uh, very keen on um, Orthodox churches having uh, outside relations and participating in the ecumenical movement until, at one point, they started allowing them, under the guidance of Moscow, to participate in the ecumenical movement. and. Um, <clears throat> I think Orthodox churches have made uh, uh, an important contribution to, to uh, the various uh, uh, commissions of the World Council of Churches. They participated in uh, many of the general assemblies of the World Council of Churches. Um, there was um, a particular opening after 1989 when the, the resurrection of the Greek Catholic churches uh, was perceived by the Orthodox in Eastern Europe as a major uh, stumbling block in the ecumenical efforts, but there was this uh, major um, uh, uh, bridging of this issue with the Balamand document that I mentioned earlier, where uh, Roman Catholics and Orthodox committed to tackling with care this uh, issue of the uh, Greek Catholic, uh, also known in some circles as Uniat churches, and um, agreeing that the method used back in the uh, 16th century, 17th century to create these churches is not an ecumenical method, is not something that is acceptable today, but at the same time accepting the reality that these churches exist. And you cannot just say, uh, they shouldn't exist. They do exist. There is, they have a tradition of several hundred years and instead of uh, denying their existence you better try to understand how to deal with them and create a climate of, uh, of understanding. And I think uh, some, uh, some Orthodox churches have become uh, a bit reluctant over the years about the ecumenical movement. They have seen um, especially some proposals um, that were not uh, received positively by the Orthodox Churches. Let's remember the Orthodox Churches are uh, rather traditional churches. Uh, they've been around uh, for uh, uh, over 1800 years and uh, they are concerned about uh, n new elements being introduced and um, that's when um, they, they were open to considering the environment, for example, as a, as a concern of Christians, as a possible ecumenical concern also, but they were not open to some of the ideas that were coming from uh, Protestant churches, including uh, the ordination of women, which was not present in the Orthodox Church, uh, the issues of recognitions of homosexual unions, 
uh, issues uh, concerning ordination of homosexuals and, and some other issues. Uh, and that um, has slowed down in recent years the involvement of, of some of the Orthodox churches. Uh, in particular, um, one of the largest, uh, the Russian Orthodox Church, um, has been um, has withdrawn from a number of ecumenical bodies, but also some other churches have withdrawn. Um, and we hope uh, that there will be some uh, reconsideration of these withdrawals because their witness is important. Mm -hmm. How uh, can we, and when I say we, is not only Orthodox, in general, Christian and Orthodox, uh, how can we effectively help to carry out Christian unity? Um, I must say that I've seen um, a bit of a fatigue in recent years in some people about the ecumenical movement. And I've seen it in particular in people who were uh, involved in, in uh, the early stages, who uh, possibly participated in, in uh, Vatican II, uh, the council that brought a lot of modernization to the Roman Catholic Church and brought the involvement of the Roman Catholic Church officially with ecumenism. Um, people who uh, contributed to drafting some of the documents we mentioned, they seem to be a bit disappointed, to say the least. They seem to find that uh, while documents were signed and agreements were uh, brought to a, a certain uh, form, there is no action, no follow-up, so to say. And um, I think that's where probably we should, um, we should try to revisit. Those are areas that need to be, um, uh, to be uh, pressed upon like that dialogue should be should continue at various levels with bilaterals with multilateral multilateral dialogues internationally nationally um, we should probably make more efforts to um, uh, raise awareness about ecumenism uh, in today's world when we live especially in western countries we live in pluralistic societies people should be aware of, of ecumenism we should do like hockey players who are going into high school and uh, continue to keep the spirits up of, of small children to get involved and, and continue to play hockey. We should introduce courses, more courses about ecumenism. We should praise the efforts of the early ecumenical pioneers and, and people who are still involved in these efforts. Um, at the parish level, uh, this should be encouraged. There is the day of, of Christian unity that is celebrated every year. In, in many parishes, there should be more of those. And there should be more mutual visits, uh, people discussing some of the documents that are relevant for them, um, and study groups. And I, I think this, these are efforts that uh, are worth uh, pursuing in order to uh, help carry out effectively Christian unity. So you speak about uh, to all levels, so you mean efforts at all levels? Yeah, absolutely, yeah. Academic, non-academic, um, uh, ecclesial level, definitely. And uh, see how um, <clears throat> this uh, can be translated in the language of different uh, groups that are interested and could contribute to, uh, to ecumenism. Can we really become united one day when we consider that our understandings of the Gospel message in various Christian traditions are uh, so far apart? This is, this is the question that is making people um, a bit skeptical today about the future of ecumenism and how um, this unity is to be conceived. It's, it's very hard to say what this unity will look like and when it will happen. I've heard people hoping for this unity to happen during their lifetimes and uh, they're disappointed that it hasn't happened. Um, but I think instead of uh, possibly creating this imaginary, this um, 
view of a perfect unity that most likely uh, has never existed, we should probably be realistic and, and try to conceive of this unity in terms of, of diversity, a unity in diversity uh, rather than a unity in terms of uniformity. Uh, we should be ready to accept uh, pluralism, we should be ready to accept uh, various forms of, of sharing and communion other than the final expectation that some churches have that uh, unless we have full sacramental communion then we don't have unity so um, people should be should be open to that and maybe practicing such a, an imperfect unity for a while maybe for several decades for several hundred years is gonna open our eyes to the next step and to uh, a, a deeper uni unity but uh, I think we should keep ourselves open about that so do you think that is there a future for ecumenism and what is the main obstacle for Christian unity again these are very difficult questions and then we are um, going into the realm of speculative um, it depends who you ask about these uh, issues I tend to be an optimist and uh, I, uh, I do see a future for, uh, for ecumenism um, it's just that at various times in, uh, in uh, our uh, century and the previous century um, more important issues have taken over and people have put on the back burner <clears throat> ecumenical concerns and uh, ec solving ecumenical issues. There, there is always uh, a crisis that is going to happen somewhere and probably we should stay more focused on uh, issues that uh, uh, concern ecumenism. So yes, personally I think there is a future for ecumenism. I, believed in, I believe in that and uh, we should probably uh, consider it. What's the main obstacle for Christian unity? I think, in my view, the main obstacle is uh, the fact that unlike the early Christians who did not have uh, to carry with them uh, a lot of uh, baggage in terms of dogmas and traditions that were formulated, we have a lot to carry with us and these are our traditions so traditions have uh, crystallized over long periods of time um, including uh, for example with Protestant churches which rejected tradition bitterly in the 16th century but after that they started crystallizing their own traditions and it's probably this the existence of these traditions and um, our commitments and loyalty to, to these traditions and our lack of flexibility uh, to adjust them to sometimes even change one or two words while um, maintaining the content of the ideas that we want to convey in order to make it more palatable um, to, uh, to groups that don't necessarily agree with with uh, with us. One example is possibly this um, statement on the doctrine of justification. I found that document amazing, um, but there are people who would say, on the one hand, that um, it's a betrayal of Luther. Uh, it went too far. It, it it says things that Luther didn't mean. And, and others who say that it didn't go far enough, there will always be something like this. But the document remains, and the study of the document, and deepening uh, the, such a document on the Catholic side, on the, or, on the uh, Lutheran side, inviting other Christians to reflect on it, as, as it happened several years ago, like the North, Amer uh, North American Academy of Ecumenists invited um, presentations by other Christians uh, other than Lutherans and Catholics to see how to react and how to 
uh, how they reacted and how how they would receive such a document I think that's the kind of exercise that should be done and uh, keeping ourselves open without uh, betraying uh, our own um, um, dear cherished traditions but being open to maybe rephrasing them reformulating them in order to come to a more common understanding Thank you very much, Professor Turcescu, for this valuable lecture on Thank ecumenism. You. Thank you very much. It was my pleasure and uh, I hope it will uh, help some people um, to uh, be more optimistic about ecumenism. And to open their hearts. Yes. <laughs> Thank you.